this organization that you can see on the bottom left here. So this is quite a spooky uh, um, uh, opportunity for me because I'm interested in going into health organizations. But there's a term crept into health, which is medical leadership and clinical leadership, which sort of has a slight ring to it, as though this is better than other forms of leadership. And I have to say, even though it's in the title of the organization I run, I bought slightly at the fact that medical or clinical leadership is anything other than leadership in a, in a different context. So um, you're a great guinea pig audience for me to test whether I'm, whether I'm right on that. <coughs> um, my background uh, is 40 years uh, uh, NHS through and through, so it's really quite hard for me to sort of move out of the, sort of the, NHS, the NHS paradigm. I had a clinical career as a neurosurgeon up till about three or four years ago. But also, the great thing I've always said about a career in medicine is that you can do thousands of other things. So I've sort of had a bit of time in, in research and development, times in training and education, and latterly spent a lot of time in operational leadership roles and also doing leadership development. Um, and now the, the faculty, just a, a very, very quick plug for that, is an organization set up by all of the medical royal colleges across the UK, of which there are 21. Um, to start to really to professionalize leadership uh, uh, amongst doctors. Because um, I think rather late in the day, we've begun to realize that uh, it isn't good enough uh, to just be good at the technical day job of being a doctor. You actually have to uh, get much better at leadership. And I guess that's quite a good introduction into this slide, which <coughs> I suspect unites us all in, uh, in this room, and that's that the financial challenges, and I'm sure you will all tell me that you've been hit infinitely harder than health has been hit, but we've all been hit staggeringly hard by what our wonderfully moral banking sector did to us a few years ago. Um, and this is a, a, a major, major uh, leadership challenge, um, as I tended to be depicted here. You are allowed to laugh at the cartoons if you want, but it's not, it's not compulsory. And also, just as an aside, I'd, I'd sooner this was a bit of a dialogue rather than, uh, than me talking at you, but I'm very happy to keep talking at you. So if you disagree with something or you don't, uh, then, uh, then please come back at me. So uh, the meat of what I want to talk about is really in the next slide. Because I, I don't know what life's like where you, where, where you work and, uh, and live, but leadership has a huge mystique attached to it. And there's, a sort, there's evidence in the literature to say that there are certain professions, certainly, that really like the word leadership. But when you ask, as I do on a pretty regular basis, right, stacks of professionals what they understand by leadership and whether they actually lead, they're pretty unclear. And I, I think it's really neatly uh, summarized in this slide. This is about doing something useful. But the bit in the middle there, the with and through people, is the bit where I think that, uh, that we, we fail pretty miserably on a pretty regular basis. And I think certainly the way that the health service has functioned in the last four to five years, I think we have we've have largely forgotten the bit about humanity because it's people that do it. And as I put at the end there, no people, no results. Um, this is a, a, a quote I quite like, and I've, I've shown this to a number of sort of NHS management audiences. But uh, which could you could be forgiven for thinking this is me, the typical clinician taking a swipe at managers. But in fact, this was um, this was in this book by Gordon Bethune. And if you've uh, and if you've read about this, but you know, basically, Continental Airlines were going down the tubes in the early 1990s, and this guy turned what was a deeply dysfunctional organisation with a deeply suspicious staff that had gone through bankruptcy or near bankruptcy on two occasions and actually was about to go through, potentially go through bankruptcy on a third occasion. And when you read the book, it's really, it's really warming to read because he basically, they, they did all the clever turnaround stuff, but what they really focused on hard was actually engaging with the staff and getting the staff to trust them um, and, and to recognize the fact that we are absolutely nothing without the staff uh, that we, we work with on a daily basis. This is just to prove that I've gone completely barking mad, but this is a, this is a great book. Um, it's an American book. The metaphor, though, comes from a study done in Newcastle University, um, which showed that, that farmers who gave their cows names and treated their cows sort of as individuals could get an awful lot more out of them. And having said, 
have to say, I would be quite happy to start talking to you about the pathophysiology of why I think that happens, but maybe uh, we'll save that for another day. But that leads some farmers to, uh, to do the following um, and really start to, uh, to, to focus on the well-being of their, of their herds. And where the hell is this going, I'm sure some of you are thinking. But if you look at the next slide, I'd be really interested to know uh, what life's like for you. But three or four times in my uh, 30, 40 year career, we've, had, we've hit some pretty powerful, pretty uh, major financial uh, challenges. And the first thing that we do is that. Um, in my last job, I was based uh, halfway up the A34, which is the, the NHS traditionally you put the regional offices where nobody can get to, uh, so that actually you don't favor one town or another. And so what we would do is we would write out to people and say, drive all the way up the A34. Some of you, you know, if they came from the Isle of Wight, they had to come probably a two, two and a half hour journey and bring your lunch because we're too bloody mean to buy you one. And, and the, the slide on the right is, is that we're ridiculously hierarchical and I'll come back to my views on Robert Francis uh, uh, a little bit later on. But what we want out of staff and what we want particularly, I think, out of staff in, in, a, in a time of, of, of huge crisis, which we're all facing at the moment, is you want discretionary effort. And a discretionary effort, as you I'm sure are aware, is just very simply the maximum amount that you can put in as an individual minus the amount, the minimum amount you have to put in without losing your job. And it is pretty self-evident that when you're in an organization that you think treats you well, then the amount of discretionary effort you will put in is way, way higher than in an organization that treats you, you, treats you really badly. And I mean, just as a quick question, I, I sort of, I'm, I'm, t I'm inclined to sort of extrapolate from what I think goes on in health to other public sector. But I don't, I mean, I, I, always, I always think that because it's a sort of the public purse, that it sort of gives us almost a freedom to say, well, we'll, we'll abuse the staff in the public sector. Is that what it feels like to you, or are you in great organizations? The camera's pointing at me, by the way. It can't see any of your name badges. And the rewards for doing that? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's one of the great things about public sector people, isn't it? I mean, I suspect, I, I, you know, I, I, I've never stepped out into the private sector, but I suspect in the private sector the rewards are a bit different to that. Um, and I think you just keep flogging people, and, uh, and your reward is that you're doing some great public service. It does wear a bit of thin after after a, a week or two, or maybe a decade or two for most of us. Any other thoughts, comments? Okay. Um, and I sort of think that um, summarizes it for me in a way. Um, Robert Francis, uh, I, you know, I'm sure you've all heard of the Francis Report. Dreadful things went on uh, in an organization in the Midlands, um, things which I think we all feel a pretty deep sense of shame of. But actually, if we're honest, we know that microcosms of what went on and maybe was more, was more sort of general in that, although it, it wasn't probably across the whole organization, but microcosms of that are probably going on in many, many parts of the country uh, as we speak. Um, Robert Francis did a, a review uh, of uh, uh, two reviews um, of, of what went on, and these were some of his conclusions. And one of the things he put, uh, sadly, number four, rather because I think actually it's number one, um, is the the issue of the, about the fact that we need to have uh, much better leadership. Um, and something which my organisation is very involved and engaged in 
is actually starting to treat this as a profession. I mean, my colleague William is going to talk to you about uh, revalidation in the health service in, in a, a little bit later on. But I think, I think it's fair to say that certainly doctors have regarded leadership as, as an amateur sport. So you remember 20, 30 years ago, then we would say somebody just scored 100 in cricket in a, t in a cricket match, and he's an estate agent during the day. And we were sort of somehow terribly proud of that. And I think that we've got to move to a, to a world that starts to recognize that leadership is every bit as important as, as being a clinician. And I'll show you some of the data that I think supports that. Um, this is the, sorry, this is too busy a slide, but I just wanted to pick out a few salient points in this. And again, just ask you to reflect whether this actually applies to you. And the reason I've, I've left it in this is a slide I use, obviously, uh, in, in most of the talks that I, uh, or the most of the audiences I deal with. But I just wonder if this, isn't, this isn't also a, a public sector problem, because the answer to this about valuing medical leaders is we don't value medical leaders in the system. We don't reward medical leaders appropriately, and we don't remunerate them. We don't give them the resources necessary to take on what is, as William will tell you shortly, is a growing uh, responsibility. But part of the problem is that as a profession, we don't value medical leaders. Um, and I think I'm hoping that the, the Faculty of Medical Leadership and Management is one way of starting to reverse that by bringing all the, the Royal Colleges into the process. But if you extrapolate this, take this out of, out of health altogether now, if you look at all our leaders in, in, in public life, I, I have a view that we put those people on an impossible pedestal. We peer through their bathroom windows to see what they're getting up to at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, and every single thing they do, we scrutinize. We allow them no leeway whatsoever. And I think the danger is, is that we're starting to get the leaders we, uh, we deserve. And certainly in my, in my youth, when you looked at politicians, these people had actually all, most of them had held down a proper job of some sort. Now we're getting people at the age of 12 who've just stepped out of, uh, out of a degree in politics somewhere who have no experience of life at all. I, you might want to turn the camera off at that point. Um, so, and I, I can understand why they do that because actually you almost got to lead a blameless life and I'm not sure I want people in our senior positions that have, that have led blameless lives. Um, I, there are, I, the, I don't know if you heard the question, it was about publishing surgeons' data, which, as you know, happened uh, at the end of last week. The cardiac surgeons' data has been out there for a long time, but they, they published the data for vascular surgeons uh, uh, last week. I think it's a good thing. I think the sooner we get data out there, then uh, I think that, A, it's great because it will drive up quality because, you know, like all of you, doctors are highly competitive. And if I look at my results and see that William's results are a bit better than mine, then sure as hell I'll try and work out what he's doing that I'm not doing to get my results up there. But I think there's also an, a, a business about educating the public because I think we've got to get the public starting to understand what data means so that somebody says, you know, shock horror, three people died last week. Well, I think they've got to understand whether that's three, three people who would have died anyway or, or whatever. So I think... I think when we start to get the data much more transparent and the public under starting to understand the data, we'll have much less of, of oh, shock horror. Sorry. And, and the question there was, are people therefore going to just focus on the target? And I, that's a really powerful question because there is evidence that shows that in the health service in the last three to four years, the health service has been very, very good at, at hitting um, some quite challenging targets. And I'm embarrassed to say that some of the targets it has hit, I was saying five years ago, we'll never achieve that. Um, the danger is, is it produces a very transactional type of leadership that just goes for the results. But I think, and I don't know, William, you might want to come in on this, but I think if we get the metrics right. So, you know, vascular surgery and mortality, it's pretty important that we don't, uh, that people don't die as a consequence of, of treating various diseases. So if we get the metrics right 
and I think they're and their quality targets as well as performance and process targets, then I think it will be a better system.